Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Praise God. I want to thank you for coming once again to join us once again on this, on this great study of the book of Esther. This great study of the book of Esther. Book of Esther is just one of these intriguing books many theologians argue should it even be in the Bible, right? Because the name of God isn't pronounced in the Bible. No one mentions the name of God in the Bible. So they say, should it even be in the Bible? But yes, it should be in the Bible because Esther is a descendant or a great, great, great grandmother of the Messiah, right? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So it should be in the Bible. And also, the reason why this story is so important is because during Babylon, Babylonian captivity, right, we find uh, as, as the Persians take over that what happens is this is the first time that, that uh, you have an individual stepping in, right, to save all of Israel from a possible holocaust. That is why this story is so important when you think about the story of Esther and Mordecai. So think about that when you get a chance, that this book is vitally important, right? Because if it wasn't for Queen Esther sacrificing herself because of the grace of God, right, Israel would have probably been in another holocaust. It would have probably been uh, no more. It would have probably been uh, a nation without a country once again, right? Because the king had all the authority. The king of Persia had all authority. He could have did away with all of Israel. So that is why this story is so important and so intriguing. And think about Esther gave, she sacrificed her life. She sacrificed her virginity. She was in bondage once again. After 70 years of bondage, yet she did not leave. Her and Mordecai did not leave, right? But because the king's edict was to gather all the beautiful women throughout all 127 provinces, that Queen Esther was subject to this because he is the king. So all women, you must come. You must come. It's not like she had a choice. You must come, right? And it's because of her great beauty and her, her, her charisma and her personality, right, which brings her into the king's palace. But let's get into this uh, text here in a few moments. I'm very excited about this passage of scripture because we're also going to talk a little bit about the genealogy of where all these individuals came from, right? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for allowing us to come together again as men and women of Christ. Thank you for this beautiful story of Esther, right? Someone of your genealogy, someone of your family seed. Thank you for allowing us to be able to, to unpack and, and, and go through this story to try to understand the significance of who she was and the sacrifice that she made. So we thank you, Lord. And I pray that if hearts are transformed, I pray that if one heart is transformed and that uh, someone finds the need to find Christ today, that they do it just by confessing Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. And you will enter in. You will, uh, you know, the door is knocking at their heart. And you said you would not deny anyone for this room at the cross and for everyone. And we know as we enter into this Easter season, we are reminded once again of who you are, that you died for us, that you sacrificed yourself for us, that we may have access to the tree of life, to paradise, to be with you forever. So we thank you, Lord, for who you are today. Thank you for this message today. I'm praising you and giving you all the grace and honor and privilege of all things, even before the message even starts. Because it's only because of your grace that I'm able to stand, even proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior to the entire world. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power that is in me that, that, that resonates, that, that is able to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, the King. Thank you, Lord, for this message once again. And I'm going to ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Here we go. The title of this message today is challenges that turn into opportunities. Challenges that turn into opportunities, right? And we're looking at the book of Esther once again. Esther, the second chapter, and we'll give like a quick summary in a moment. Esther, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7, but we're going to get a little bit past that. We're going to just be floating around the book of Esther, for, uh, probably a little bit of the third chapter as well, because it is so important that we understand each aspect of each one of these verses and what it means, right? None of it is filler. Everything that is in the book of Bible means something. Every period, every comma, every quotation mark, everything that is in the Bible means something. And we have to get something out of it, right? So the night is far spent. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on God's marvelous light. Hmm. So our scripture reading today is going to come from the book of 2 Chronicles. And this is actually part of the story as well. But I chose it as a scriptural reading once again so that we may be able to understand once again the significance of the story and what it means, right? The book of Esther. So 2 Chronicles 17 through 23. And it reads, Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house 
of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. Hmm. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of the princesses, all of these he brought to Babylon. Talking about Babylonian captivity, right? This is our story today. And they burnt the house of God and broke it down, broke down the walls of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried them away to Babylon, right? where they were servants to him and his sons into the reign of the kingdom of Persia. So here we are. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah and to the, and to the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, right? They had enjoyed their rest. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. What that means is that they had went into their rest, but now their rest is disturbed because of their unfaithfulness. Now in the first year, verse 20, uh, first, first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kings of the, of the earth hath the Lord God has given me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Who are you, right? The Lord his God be with you and let him go up. You are free. And so, as it went, right, that the children of Israel left uh, uh, previously Babylon-controlled territory, now controlled by the Persians. King Cyrus says that you are free because God has spoken to my heart. Here he is, a pagan god, a pagan king, right, telling individuals like him. And he serves like, you know, he serves idols. But God spoke to his heart and said, you know, your God, this God has said, you need to return back to your land and build, rebuild a temple to worship me. So here we go. So as we summarize from last week, right, we learned that Queen Vashti had refused to appear in front of the king after a six-month provincial celebration and a, a, a six-day post-event for King Xerxes' cabinet. And we learned that Queen Vashti was angry for a number of reasons. We don't understand all the reasons why. But we do understand that, uh, that all these women, all these women that were part of this concubine, right? These women, this is not a pleasant thing to be a part of a concubine. If the king enjoyed you, if he really liked you, he would call you back again. You'd go, you'd spend the night with him. If he called you back, fine. If not, you were just subjected to him. Uh, it's, it's, it's sex trafficking, theoretically. So you were subjected to him for the rest of your life. You were stuck with the king for the rest of your life. Or maybe until you got older, maybe he would release you then or something like that. But if he liked you, he would call you back over and over again. So it's sex trafficking. Esther was part of sex trafficking, right? She was part of this, this concubine or this system that the king said, I want all versions, all vessel versions. I want every version to come unto me, right? And I'll see if they're beautiful and all this. And I'll put them through this long 12-month process, this six-month process of purification of oils and, and things like this. Because I want them to smell a certain way. I want them to look a certain way. I want them to have the diet dietary habits uh, that that I have, right? Or I just want them to look a certain way. I want them to be healthy. It's almost like Daniel, right? So this is what has happened. So here we go. So we learned that Queen Vashti was angry for a number of reasons. No invite to either of those events, as I just stated. And being asked to make an appearance on the last day of the post-event. I mean, she was upset, right? And we are unsure about how Queen Vashti would have, uh, would have to make that appearance, right? What we find in Scripture is that women are being asked to do things that are for the purpose of pleasure, right? We know that uh, Salome, the stepdaughter of King Herod, danced provocatively for John the Baptist's head, right? This is a patriarchal society. Men run things. Kings run things. Queens could have up to half of the kingdom, but not all the kingdom, right? So we know Salome danced provocatively. You know, her mother put her up to it to dance for the head of, King of, of, of John the Baptist. Right. Another classic example of that coming from First Kings, uh, the first chapter, where we find King David, who is weary, he's old, he's on the verge of death. Right. And what happened is it is his servants who try to find a way to comfort him before he dies. Right. He cannot get warm. He cannot get warm. It is his servants. They go out throughout of all of Israel. Right. And they try to find a virgin. They try to find someone young. Right. To come and keep him warm. Because he is one also that has several concubines, right? Hmm. 
So here we go. He could not keep warm. So, and, and, and he needed a nurse, right? That's quote unquote, I need someone to take care of me, but not an, uh, a nurse nurse, but someone really just to keep him warm. So she will lie in your arms and keep you warm, right? So they searched throughout the country for a beautiful girl and they found Abishag from Shuman. She was a, a Shunamite and brought her to the king. And we find that the girl was very beautiful and she took care of the king. And despite this, the king could not find warmth. It was time for him to die. He's old, he's weary, right? I don't care how many virgins you bring to him and say, quote unquote, this is your nurse, right? He cannot do the things he used to do. So here we go. So as we contrast King Artaxerxes with this event, we begin to see the value of women during this time. They had no value, right? We begin to witness uh, what it was like to be a part of the entitled, the ruling class of the Persian Empire. Men existed, uh, you know, pleasure, you know, their, their main thing was pleasure, you know, to find pleasure in these women. Idol worship was common, right? All forms of sexual exploitation, slavery of all forms, that was common during this time period, right? Because as I stated just a few moments ago, that all of Israel was released back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They had been in bondage for 70 years. So the pleasure of these men came from what they saw with their own eyes, the, the simple pleasures of life derived from what they owned and what was pleasing, right, in their hearts. So we find this to be true in the story of King Artaxerxes and others. So, so on one specific day, a search goes out for a virgin. A search to further pleasure the king's political power and position. Uh, Queen Vashti has messed up. We'll never hear from her again. So now a search goes out, just as in the story of David, to find someone, not to keep him warm, but to pleasure him. Hmm. And to place the crown, the royal diadem, the queen diadem on his head, on her head. So here we go. A search goes out. The queen should be more beautiful than all the women of the provinces. For we know this to be true because the most beautiful women throughout the region were called to be seen by the king to meet with his approval. Right? I was reading uh, a th one theologian stated, it's, it's almost like, I hate to say this, almost like test driving a car. He had to test drive all of his vehicles until he found one that he liked. That's as blunt as I can put it. That's as, as disgusting as I can put it. Queen Esther is someone that people should be preaching about a hundred times, a hundred times a year, right? What she had to sacrifice. She sacrificed her body, her virginity, right? For the pleasure, right, of a Canaanite king. Someone who didn't even believe in God, right? But God had a specific purpose for her. He had a specific purpose for her guardian, Mordecai. Let's get into this. So, uh... These challenges become opportunities. Here we go. Let's look at the story. So there are 23 verses in chapter 2 that provide us with the king's dilemma and his desires, a certain Jew named Mordecai, Mordecai's obligation to advise and protect Esther, a king's decree for all women to be seen by the king, and Esther's sensibilities. So the second chapter of the book of Esther is most intriguing because we, we now get an introduction of Esther. But most importantly, this is a story of Mordecai, right? The caregiver of Esther. The scripture describes him as a certain Jew, right? Let's read a little bit of the text first, and then we're going to begin to unpack this passage of scripture. This is powerful, right? So here we go. The second chapter of the book of Esther, verses 1 through 7, right? But after Xerxes' anger had cooled, he began thinking about Vashti and, and what she had done and the decree that he had made. So his attendants suggested, us, let us search out into the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. And let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at Susa. Haggai, the eunuch in charge, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. And after that, the young women who pleases you most will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect immediately. Verse 5. Now at the fortress of Susa, there was a certain Jew named Mordecai, son of Jari, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimei. Now before you start laughing, right, or if you're a Bible reader, right, when I, what I just read should bring tears to your eyes or laughter to your heart, right? So this Mordecai, right, who is a cousin, who is the caregiver of Esther. Think about this for a moment. Mordecai is from the house of Benjamin. And he's from the house of, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, but from the house of King Saul. King Saul, the one who tried to kill David, right? 
I don't want to go too deep into this, but I want you to, to get a picture of what's going on in this beautiful passage of Scripture today. So he is a descendant of King Saul. Think about that when you get a chance. King Saul, who did the wrong thing, and we're going to get into this in a minute, because he, there's someone who is uh, opposed to Mordecai for a specific reason. Okay? Remember back in the desert, right, when the Israelites had left Egypt, that these, this tribe called the Amalekites were trying to kill all the uh, Israelites that were staggering behind, the old people, the young people, and things like that, that couldn't catch up. They were like this like, little tactical group that would come down, swoop down, and, and kill and, and take people, you know, take their wives and children, their crops and stuff, and kill them and stuff like this, and then disappear. And so in Scripture, oftentimes you'll hear how uh, you know, God hated Esau. Well, you hear God hates the Amalekites, and he has given several kings, right, several opportunities to destroy all the Amalekites, right? King Saul was one of them. You're supposed to destroy all these people, every man, woman, child, all of their, everything that they have. All of their animals must be destroyed. He failed to do that one thing, right? This is King Saul, okay? And we find that Samuel, what Samuel does, Samuel steps in, Samuel steps in, right? And he says, what is this noise in my ear when he goes to see King, King Saul, you know, after a battle with the Amalekites? What is this bleeding of sheep in my ear? What is this thing that I'm hearing in my ear? You were, didn't God tell you to destroy all of these people? Why do I hear these sheep in my ear? And why is King Agag still standing before me? Why haven't you killed him yet? King Saul says, like, you know what, some of, these, some of these sheep and oxen and stuff will be great for sacrifice. That's not what God said. I want you to destroy everything. Right? And why is this king still, and, you know, I'm sure mid-sentence, he takes the sword and goes into King Agag and kills him. And at that point, right, Samuel walks away. Samuel walks away. King Saul is dragging him and walking behind him, probably running by him, saying, listen, listen, please forgive me. Give me another chance. Because the scriptures tell us that the Spirit of God left King Saul at that moment for not doing what he was supposed to do, which was to destroy all of the Amalekites and King Agag. The Spirit of God never returned, nor did Samuel. So we never see Samuel and King Saul ever having a conversation again. So here we go. So this Mordecai, as I stated, is of the house of Saul. All right. So this is several generations, right? So a little bit about Mordecai. He is, he is a direct descendant of King Saul, right? He is the great, great grandchild of Meshabeth, Meshabosheth, right? Mephibosheth, get this, when King David destroyed all of the house of King Saul, there was a crippled young man by the name of Mephibosheth. David had kindness in his heart. As in all of Israel, you're supposed to show kindness and generosity to, the, to, to everyone you destroyed or everyone you put to the sword, right? Or everyone who has died, and that's what's happened. King Saul and his sons had died, but he did have another son by the name of Mephibosheth, right? King David says, listen, you will eat at my table for the rest of your life. That means I will not destroy you. All of your brothers were killed in battle and your father but you will eat, I will have kindness, I will have grace on you, and you will eat at my table for the rest of your life. So this is where you get Mordecai. Mordecai comes out of this seed, this long seed, right? So I hope I'm not losing you. But all of these stories are connected. So here we go. What we know about Mordecai is that he, his family was deported to Babylon, as I stated in the scripture. He was one of those families that were deported to Babylon. Mordecai, like many major men in the scriptures, is from the tribe of Benjamin. Men like Saul, the first king of Israel, as I stated. Paul, Judge Ehud, the prophet Jeremiah, all of the house of Benjamin. God loves the house of Benjamin. He loves the tribe of Benjamin. He loves Benjamin. Why? Because it's the smallest, right? Because the scripture tells us that the, the first shall be last and the last first, right? It doesn't matter about size, right? You could be from the, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Reuben, these big tribes. Benjamin is the smallest of the tribes, but God shows favor with this tribe. Hmm. So what we know, this is what we know about this, right? All descendants from the tribe of Benjamin. Mordecai is one that has been through some challenges in his life. When his aunt and uncle died, right, he adopted Esther. He felt responsible for caring for Esther and advising her in her life. When her, uh, when he, so, so he is the advisor. He is the caregiver of her. So today our focus is on the faith and the commitment of these two people, Mordecai and faithful Esther, right? Get this, Mordecai loves God. He loves Israel, okay? 
He is an advocate for Israel. And as I stated, is from the mighty tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of the 12 tribes, which means, right, that, that God once again has provided us as believers a reason to ally, ally ourselves with the smallest, right, to show favor and grace to the smallest. David was unkempt. He was small. He was the smallest of his brothers, right? And God chose him. God is always choosing the smallest, right? Those things that you, know, that you don't pay attention to. Zechariah, climb the sycamore tree. I will eat at your house tonight, right? Always choosing the smallest of things, right? The little boy with uh, two loaves of fish, five, uh, five fish and two, uh, two fish and five loaves of bread, the smallest of things to, in order to enact a miracle, right? So that his grace may be fulfilled. Think about that when you get a chance. So after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. We're reading this in its, in its, in its entirety. So then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be a fun, uh, young vir virgin sought for the king. And the king appointed officers in the provinces, and they went out to find uh, Queen Esther. So here we go. Point number one, he was a Jew. He was a Jew, as I stated. The scripture began to tell us, right, in verse 5, and I'm going to go back to the uh, reason why I was saying that you're going to laugh or uh, you're going to say, oh, I remember, right? So when we look at that verse 5, now at the fortress of Susa, there was a certain Jew, a certain Jew. Isn't that something how the scripture always makes reference to certain things, right? Because it, it changes your mindset. It changes how you're thinking about the situation. First, you're reading about the king of Persia, 127 provinces, most powerful man on the planet, right, at that time. Huge army, huge, huge population, several languages and dialects, right? He runs things, right? The king of Persia. But, Scripture says, it's almost like, uh, and here we go again, you know? It's like, it's like uh, you know, there was a certain Jew, right? It's almost like, uh, and it came to pass, right? So here we go. And there was a certain Jew named Mordecai, and he was the son of Jair. So what that means is he is a descendant. What the scripture is telling us to do is research who this individual was, right? And then it goes on to say he was from the tribe of Benjamin, right? And was a descendant of Kish and Shimei. Okay, so here we go. People are saying, oh, so who's Shimei? Shimei, get this, oftentimes when you read scripture, when Absalom is trying to take over the house of David, trying to take over his father's throne, right? That as King David, as he talked to God and God said to pretty much leave, do not destroy Absalom, David packs up him and all of his faithful believers. They're on these horses and chariots and carts and things like this. And they're leaving Jerusalem. And as he's leaving Jerusalem, slowly leaving Jerusalem because Absalom is coming one way and David's have to go the other to prevent uh, any type of civil war, that there's this old man, when you read this in Samuel, right? There's this old man by the name of Shimei. And he is the one who is kicking dust and cursing at King David. He's cursing at him. Why? Because he's of the house of Benjamin. He's of the house of Benjamin, of the house of Saul. He's a descendant of, of, of Saul as well, right? And so what's happened is he is cursing David. He's kicking up dust, and he is shouting all these profanities at King David. Why? Because he feels that he was responsible for the death of Saul, of King Saul. So he's angry. And so God finds grace in Shimei, right? Abishag was supposed to, you know, he turns to David, you know, he's David's lieutenant. He says, should I kill this, this fool, this, this guy who's cursing us, right? David says, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay. Let him throw rocks and curse all he wants, right? May God be with him. We, we are to show grace and favor to everyone, right? But we, 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 we learn later, right, when King Solomon comes into rule, that David says, I don't trust the heart of Shimei at a certain opportunity, find a reason to destroy him, right? So that's who Shimei is. He's the one who's kicking up dust, making all this noise, thinking that David was responsible for killing King Saul. So here we go. So why is this important to us that he was a Jew, right? Again, the Bible wants us to know that Christ is working on behalf of his chosen people. Plain and simple. Also, historically, a reminder that something involves God's intervention into something that involves national transition and transformation. God is transforming his people all throughout scripture. Even though they have been, even though he has been sent to save them, they deny him. They don't want him to be their savior, right? And so that's what's happening in this passage of scripture. His, it's a reminder that something involving God's intervention, right, 
has to do with it has to do with national transition and transformation, right? That he was a Jew. In other words, telling us that Mordecai is a Jew means that from a historical perspective, that Judaism was part of a transforming society. I don't care about Persia ruling the world. There was a certain man by the name of Mordecai, and he was a Jew, right? That means something is about to happen. That means that this is one of God's chosen people, right? From his chosen tribe, that is about to do something that you cannot understand or ascertain. That's the best way I can put it, right? We learn once again about a particular tribe that God told King Saul to destroy, but he did not destroy them all, as I stated, the Amalekites, right? Making mention of Mordecai being a Jew reminds us of the captivity of God's people, but not only that, he is a Benjamite. Keep, keep that in mind. A descendant of Kish, who is the father of King Saul, a certain Jew. Huh. And so it is, before we move any further in the book of Esther, let's not forget that Christ came to save his people. Let's get that out in the open. He came to save all of Israel. He'll do it at all costs, right? The scriptures tell us that in Matthew 15 and 24, that I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And we are reminded again in Matthew 15, 21 through 28, of a certain Canaanite woman who begs Jesus to save her daughter, who is possessed by a demon and suffering. The woman knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus replied, that is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But, but, but she worshiped him. I said that three times and pleaded again, Lord, help me. Right? It is a right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs, Christ says. And she replies, the Canaanite woman replies, yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs are permitted, amen, to eat crumbs that fall beneath their master's table. That's us today. We are eating the crumbs that fall from the master's table. We are eating a remnant. She is pretty much saying, listen, I know you're giving them the good stuff. You're giving them the filet mignon, right? But I don't mind licking the bones, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I know they're eating the best meat, the choice meat, and drinking uh, the, the best milk and, and, and the finest honey, right? But I don't mind eating the crumbs, right? that are fit for a fly or a mouse, right? Because I know there's some grace in there. There's some properties in there that I can be blessed by, that my daughter can be blessed by, right? I was sent for that. Lost tribe of it. No, 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 no. But I know the dogs eat crumbs that fall from the master's table, right? I mean, there are some remnants in there. There's some good stuff in there that I can be blessed by, right? So don't sweep up everything from the floor. Let me be blessed by what's left on the floor, right? I don't want everything. I, I, I don't know about the Torah, and I don't know, know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know about Moses, and, and I don't know where I should be worshiping and this, this, and this, right? But I do know, right? I do know that if you just give me a piece of you, I will be blessed. That's the faith that I have in you, and that's the faith that we should have in our own Savior, Jesus Christ, right? We've seen that today on, on the TV screens, right? If I could just have a little bit of water, if, if I could walk just one more step, if, if I can fight one more day, if, if I had one more bullet, if I had, you know, if I, if I had one more opportunity, I would do this. I, I'm fighting for my people. I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting for the crumbs that fall from the table. Because I know there's some grace properties in there. What, what, what you're providing for is what you have provided for my family, right? Democracy. I'm fighting for what makes sense. I'm fighting for freedom for my children so they can play in parks and get a good education. There's something good in this. So we know these events was God's efforts to introduce himself to the Gentile people, right? And these stories, right, they, 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 they touch our hearts, but you got to dig deep. And then once you dig deep, you start to realize, right, that, that God is everything that I was talking about for the past several weeks in Psalm 139. He is the one who has knit us, right, woven us together in our mother's womb and said, this is the purpose I'm going to have for her. This is the pur purpose I'm going to have for him. You don't realize it, but you don't know you may be the savior of your entire nation. You may become a, a president one day that decides, you know what, what you're doing is wrong, right? And what I want you to do, God, is reach out and help. And I have a voice, and I am willing to die for your people because all these are your people. In the story of Esther and Mordecai, it's all about the lost sheep of Israel. This event is hundreds of years and generations before the birth of Jesus Christ, 
but was necessary to prevent the possible mass genocide of all of Israel once again, right? There are people still walking back to Jerusalem 500, 800 miles away. They're still walking back to Jerusalem at this time, I'm sure, camping out alongside the road, right? trying to get back to Jerusalem to build this temple, right? But because of Esther, right, this genocide did not take place. What we learn is that without Esther, amen, the children of Israel are in dire straits. They are subject to annihilation and possible enslavement once again to those who survive. And we're going to find out why in a moment. Esther is the Savior. She is the one to, who has came to restore. She's been appointed by God to be a deliverer for God's people, right? To again nurture a seed that must be planted, amen, watered and cultivated. Instead of this seed being crushed underfoot, God decides to bring a sword, a sword that, that seamlessly, through words and wisdom, preserves the seed of Christ, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. There was nothing made that was not made by God. So it's, be, be, it's, it's because of the words, the gracious words of Esther, that His people, God's people, are saved from annihilation, so a young virgin, God bless her, she didn't want to do this, right? But because of the times, she was forced into this sex trafficking event. All the beautiful young maidens, right? The eunuchs went out through all the provinces looking for all the beautiful young girls and gathering them up and bringing them. And we know that Mordecai in the scriptures, when you read the story, is following behind Esther. He doesn't want to be destroyed, but he's following behind her to ensure that she, she just does everything properly, right? I don't want her to be destroyed. Her, you know, her family has been destroyed. She has no one except me. So what is unusual is that you would think that the king would simply select a woman who already is in his concubine, right? But because of his power, as I stated, because of his selfishness, because of the desires of his heart, right? I want something fresh, right? So what we find here is that Esther has been called by God, maybe not in the position of a prophet, but as one who is sent, right? Sent to intervene in the saving of God's people. So there was a woman by the name of Mary who once stated that, how can I be with child? I, I have not known any man, and we are told that this birth process is from the Holy Ghost, Gabriel says, the angel Gabriel says. And Mary's response is, I am the Lord's servant, be it unto me according to thy word, and the angel of the Lord departed from her. I can hear Esther saying, saying the same thing. Lord, I, I don't understand this process, but I know that you're with me. This is something that I'm not choosing to do, but I know that you are with me. Be it your will, Lord. Right? It's almost like Joseph being uh, enslaved, right? I'm innocent. I'm in prison, but be, hey, whatever your will, Lord, I'm willing to do it. Because I have faith and trust in you that you will deliver me from this particular situation. I know that you will. I know that you will. And if it is not your will, that if it is your will that I die, that I know that is your will as well. But I know that I was an instrument for you to save someone along the way. Hmm. I am the Lord's servant. Be it unto me according to thy word. So what we find in this story is that God will always send somebody to save his children Israel. And just like Gideon was sent to fight against the Midianites, Joshua against the, the Canaanites, David against the Philistines, right? God will always send somebody. He's always got to send a leader or something to, to, to promote, right? To continue to uh, galvanize, to continue to uh, keep his remnant, keep his chosen people together, even though they don't accept him. So then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, let there be a fair young virgin sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in the provinces of the kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins into Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, into the custody of Haggai, the king's chamberlain, right? He was a eunuch. He was the keeper of the women, right? And let their things for, 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 uh, for purification be given them, right? Here are all, everything you need for purification. These, these are the foods that you will eat. This is the time you go and eat these foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. These are the oils that you'll be bathing with for the next several months. I want everything right before you go see the king. Point number two, preserve his people. Preserve his people. Point number two, challenges that turn into opportunities, right? Preserve his people. 
So what is occurring here is that the king's proclamation is that, is that the authority of Queen Vashti has run its course and, and that the eunuchs and, and all his administration have agreed that the embarrassment of the king must be handled. We must appoint a queen immediately. The selection and purification, which is preliminary in the vetting process, is underway, and the king is pleased. And let's read this, verse 8. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together into Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification, with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens, which were, to meet, uh, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her, preferred Esther and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. What that means is I'm placing you not out there. I'm placing you next to the palace. You are part of my favored women. Hmm. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into to, under, uh, unto the king, right? After that, she had been 12 months, according to the manner of the women. For so were the days of their purifications accomplished. Uh, to wit, six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, and whatsoever she desired was given to, uh, her to go with her out of the house of the women into the king's house. What that means is, wherever you came from, whatever you tribe you came from, what, you know, what, whatever, you can bring those things with you. You know, some outer garments, maybe, uh, you know, favorite instruments, things that you want to uh, make you feel uh, at peace, right, in the king's presence, right? He doesn't want this to be an opportunity uh, just for him. You know, I want you to feel good about this too, is what he's saying. So bring something, you know, bring some of your mementos from, from, <laughs> from you know, where you grew up, right? Maybe your favorite jewelry that your grandmother gave you or something like that. I want you to feel good about this because I, I, I want us to have a good time together. I want you to be at peace. I want you to tell me about those mementos that you have. Hmm. So in the evening, she went out, and she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Sheshagaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. And she came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing, right? I'm not taking anything with me. I don't want to pleasure the king. I don't want him to feel good about this situation. I don't want him to think that I feel good about the situation. So however way they found me is the way they're going to receive me, period. Okay? She required nothing, right? And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. She didn't even try hard. I don't want to even be a part of this process, but I'll play along, theoretically. Esther was taken to, unto King Ahasuerus and to the house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins that he had set the royal crown, uh, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Vashti has been ousted. She is like way out in the wilderness someplace in another house, right? She's no longer queen. She no longer has the crown. So now the crown is taken from Queen Vashti and placed on the head of Esther. Mm. Then the king made a great feast unto all the provinces and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. What that means is Mordecai is not far off. It's almost like when Jesus is crucified, we know that Peter is kind of, lingering around, you know, keeping his hands warm. He's, you know, I'm in and I'm out. I mean, you know, I, I, I love the Lord, but, you know, I don't know what's going to happen here. And he denied Christ three times. But Mordecai is hanging around because I want to make sure that this girl is okay. I don't want any harm to come upon her. If we got to flee, we've got to flee, right? If we've got to go, we got to go, right? I know that she's been taken Right? So I'm waiting at the gate. I, I'm looking in. I'm trying to figure out what is going on in there. Is Esther okay? I have responsibility. I am her father now. I love her. And the Persians are mistreating my daughter. Point 
number three, the plot to kill the king. So here we go, challenges that turn into opportunities, and we're seeing them, these challenges that turn into opportunity. And our Esther is selected, right? Challenges that turn into opportunities. Mordecai, right, he's being elevated, but he didn't realize it yet, right? Challenges that turn into opportunities. Challenges that turn into opportunities. So verse 20 says that Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her, pe nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. That means he had not told anyone that he is, that she is Jewish, right? For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Mordecai said, don't tell anyone that you are Jewish. So in, the, so in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, right, get this, Bichthon and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wroth and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, right? They, they're, they're wanting to assassinate the king for whatever reason, right? And the king was known, and this thing was known to Mordecai. Mordecai found out about it. He heard about these two eunuchs, these, these two guards, right? These high-level officials that, that are always near the king, and they're wanting to kill him. Mordecai hears about this, right? And the thing was known to him, and he told it unto Esther, the queen. Esther is now queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. She said, you know what? My father, my, my guardian, he has said that these two men, Bigthon and Teresh, are seeking to destroy you. Hmm. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. We're already seeing the saving grace of Esther, right? These two men want to destroy the king, right? And, and so this is the very first event where we see the grace of Esther being tested, right? And how she is being trusted by the king, Artaxerxes. How she's being trusted by him, right? These two men, I heard from my uncle that they are trying to kill you, right? So what we want to take from this passage of scripture today is Esther now is on the throne. She is a queen. And it's something that she was reluctant to do, but because you're in bondage, you're in, you're in a nation where you don't have a voice, right? She is beautiful to look upon. She is fair. She is she she and and she does take she doesn't take anything with her. I mean, she comes just as she is, and it pleased the king. And now she wears the crown. She is the queen of Persia, and her voice matters. Next week, what we're going to talk about is the return of the Malachites, right? And you can read ahead on this, because what you find is as you look at the genealogies of each of these people, just as I told you about Shimei, right? Shimei is of the house of Benjamin. Mordecai is of the house of Benjamin. Esther is from the house of Benjamin, right? Shimei wanted to kill uh, King David, right? Because he thought that he had killed King Saul. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So now we have you turn into the, uh, the Amalekites. Now, when we get into the next passage of Scripture in chapter 3, we're going to hear about a name, name, man named by the name of Haman. And Haman is a... Uh, of, of the king's house, right? And he's appointed, he's a high official. He is like the prime minister of all of Persia, right? And Haman is of the tribe of Agag. Don't want to give too much away, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Agag is when, when God told Saul to kill King Agag of the Amalekites, different name, same tribe, and he failed to do so and Agag is standing there, and Samuel says, didn't God tell you to do this one thing and you didn't do it? Right? What is this bleeding of sheep in my ear? Right? This is Agag. So what we find is Haman is a descendant of Agag. So now, next week, we're going to, it's called, you know, the title is The Return of the Amalekites, right? These Amalekites just won't go away. So that's what we'll talk about on next week. So I thank God for this scripture. I thank God for Esther as, a, as, as we look deeper and deeper into the text and, and what she had to, what her and Mordecai had to go through, right? They, they're, they're walking on eggshells, but their faith, right, is, is big. It's bigger than any mustard seed faith. It is, it is something that is uh, telling them to preserve the nation, right? To do what God is telling you to do in times of, of adversity, and this is a very difficult time for both of them. 
Mm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you once again for this passage of scripture. Uh, the story of Esther is one that resonates with all of us. It tells us that we should have faith, right? Genuine faith. And that we should exercise grace and mercy at all times, despite our enemies who despitefully use us and persecute us, right? In all directions. That we just maintain the faith, keep the courage, keep the faith, right? Do what you tell us to do. Because it seems like you always have a specific purpose in mind for us on the other side. And it's not about us, but it's about you. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to understand these things. Thank you for this passage of scripture today, the second chapter of the book of Esther. We know it resonates with all of us as Gentiles, right? That we find grace, that we know that the same God that worked with Esther, right, is the same God that is working with us now. The spirit of discernment. Thank you for a spirit of discernment, a spirit to understand that, that, that all evil won't destroy you, that you are the God of the light. So we thank you, Lord. And if there are if there is one who doesn't know Jesus Christ as a pardon of the sins, this is their opportunity to, to choose him, to confess with their mouth that he is the Savior of the entire world. Don't wait too late, right? For tomorrow is not promised to any man. So, Lord, bless us and keep us on this day. And it is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen.